what I was trying to say is I'm all fed up. <laughs> when uh, <clears throat> Pastor Wagenshoes was speaking about trying down the, the grass, Oftentimes when you read your Bible and it talks about a path, a path, that's a trodden down way. Someone has preceded us and prepared the way. I, uh, I was going to get up and quip and say, all right, everybody go home. Somebody already stole that, so I... <laughs> when somebody steals your thunder, the best thing you can do is forget it. But anyway. Um, a lot of things go through my mind, and I don't want to belabor that um, about this church. But when I talk about this church, I'm not speaking about the structure. I'm speaking about you and the ladies who got up and sang. Beautiful. But I think of your parents and how your parents, did they ever tell you how they met? It was at camp. I know. I was there then. <laughs> I, uh, I wrestled with what to preach. And what I'm going to speak about this afternoon is something that I believe all of our churches need to practice. Now, there are a lot of things that we should practice, but I do believe that this one quality, if we practice it and do it well, because uh, what it will do is that we allow people to grow and the assembly will grow, the church, the people who are assembled together. Um, <clears throat> Paul writes 14 books of the New Testament. With re that regard, this one book that I'm going to ask you to turn to in just a moment is his shortest letter. And it's written to an individual. And I want to show you this letter that he writes. Some have named, nabbed it a postcard because of its brevity. But uh, what is contained in this letter is that quality that a church needs. And on a day like this, just do what we've learned, what we've received, what we've heard what we've seen, the examples. Um, I wrestled with preaching that. But I'm thinking, anyway, just do it. And I, I want to throw this in, that what is taught by Paul here, and it applies to our salvation. Uh, this is a beautiful letter that he writes. I've purposefully not named it, but I've seen some of you turn already. And if you're familiar, you, you, you have already turned there. He wrote this much like Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians because those books were written around 64 A.D. The great apostle is going to pass off the scene shortly. And I've always heard that uh, sometimes the... At the end of someone's life, the things that they say have a greater uh, significance than perhaps the things they said earlier. Sure. Now, I'm not trying to make one portion of Scripture greater than another. I'm just simply saying that I believe if you practice the quality that is taught in this one book, as a corporate body, in other words, church complete, but also as individuals, 
And first of all, you need to practice it as an individual and then practice it as a church. And what I'm going to do is not give you three points in a poem or something like that, but rather I want to read the scripture with you and talk you through it. And uh, I don't apologize for preaching. And by the way, preaching is not always loud. But preaching is persuasive. I distinguish between teaching and preaching. I'm not trying to teach. I'm trying to persuade you to practice this quality. And uh, walk you through it. And let you see as the apostle, and he calls himself the aged. I kind of uh, fit that, the aged. And, uh, and he's speaking to someone younger. And uh, he's speaking to another person in another church. And it's just interesting. So enough of an introduction. Let's go to the book of Philemon, would you? Philemon. Personally, I've never heard a message from Philemon. And uh, <clears throat> I can kind of understand why, because the brevity of it. But uh, in this day and time, it was said in historical records that the Roman Empire probably had 60 million slaves in that empire. Now, we're not talking about just Rome. We're talking about the Roman Empire, which lasted some four to five, seven hundred years. Think of that. And our nation is barely 200 years old. That empire lasted for nearly 700 years. And they had gobbled up a bunch of land. Palestine is one area. But... Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to one man on the behalf of another man. And I want you to understand that in order to understand what, what truth we're trying to teach you. And by the way, it's not a new truth. You've heard messages about this in the past, different portions of Scripture. But I want you to see how the Apostle Paul approached it. And how that we need to do the same. Let's pray and then we'll get into it. My Father, I, I know that I cannot do justice in teaching or preaching this passage of Scripture. It certainly is not, it's above my skill. However, my Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will talk to those who are here. And on this uh, commemorative day, that individuals might absorb this truth coming from your word and the aged Paul. And may we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This truth is going to be coupled with some other verses in Ephesians, but Paul begins very simply, and he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, verse 1, of course, and Timothy, our brother, Unto Philemon. So Paul is writing to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Now he calls Philemon dearly beloved and fellow laborer. I don't think Paul would speak or address someone as uh, dearly beloved if he wasn't sh pretty well sure of his salvation. And then he said, fellow laborer. In other words, we're laboring together. And I want you to see Paul's approach in this. And then in verse 2, he comes back and says, to our beloved Appia. Now, Appia was probably Philemon's wife. So in a sense, he's addressing the family and he's addressing the family and saying, I'm talking to not only the husband, but also to the wife. And oftentimes a wife has some pull with her husband. I watched that at the lunch table today. Pastor uh, Wagon Shoots had some pie on his Preach. in front of him. Preach. And he looked down and all of a sudden there was a hand that moved it away. 
If that had been my hand, he would have cut it off. But since it was his wife's hand, she just got a nasty look. So he needs to practice what the truth is that I'm going to preach. I was fishing for another illustration, so he did well to serve me that way. So Paul is addressing the wife, and every time that another brother addresses the wife along with the husband, you know, do you understand the consoling effect that it has? Can you join with me a little bit? He goes on to say, and uh, Archippus, our fellow soldier, in other words, fellow laborer is Philemon, and uh, Archippus is a fellow soldier, and to the, look what it says, to the church in thy house. Philemon, I believe, and historically it's recorded, uh, probably was a landowner and he had slaves. And evidently the church met in his house. Now some of us believe that that church that met in his house is Colossae. The book of Colossians written about that church. Now I can't stand here and say absolutely that's the case, but I sure have strong suspicion of that. So this man was very important. He was important in the church. He was a beloved brother. He was a fellow laborer, and the church met in his house. They oftentimes met in homes or houses, and evidently this man had some substance in order for it to meet there. And then he says, Paul just simply says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's oftentimes a greeting that Paul issues or gives. And so we've got the greeting here. Fellow laborer, church in thy house. I've talked to your family. I've recognized others in the church as well, Archippus. But then Paul transitions. And he begins in verse 4 with his commendation to this man Philemon. Now, I just from what Paul writes, and because God allows it to be holy writ, to me, that gives it all truth and gravity that it's true what he's saying. And so whenever God says that a person had an excellent spirit, I just kind of believe that that person had an excellent spirit. Don't you? Hello? Shake your head, even though you can't speak. That's all right. Uh, I just want to know that you're awake. I'll try to move on quicker. He says, listen, listen to Paul speak. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Now, how can you resist somebody who's always praying for you? Do you understand? Paul eases into this because what he is about to ask this man is really contrary to our nature to accept. So what I'm about to show you from Scripture is contrary to our nature. Hello? Okay, anyway, uh, look at verse 5. Hearing of thy love and faith, which that thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Wait a minute now. I, I'm praying for you always, Philemon. And uh, I, I, hear, I hear things about you. And what I hear is about your love and your faith. Your love and your faith. Not only toward the Lord Jesus, but toward who? Toward the saints. The church. Where's the church meeting? In his house. So Paul's addressing that. Then in verse 6 it says, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Oh my gracious. Paul has a bottle of syrup. Maybe molasses would be better. And he is just pouring out the molasses on this dear brother Philemon. 
Can't you just see the molasses coming over his head and going down over his face? And, and Philemon, Philemon at first was probably a very staunch, stalwart man, but you can just see his shoulders sinking and boy, Paul is just pouring it on. He says the communication, listen, not, not only have I heard about your love and your faith, but I've heard that you've communicated your faith to others and all every good work that you've done. How, how could we resist that? Paul continues to pour it on. Verse 7, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. Paul has really poured it on about this man and the commendation toward him. And he's saying, listen, by the way, this is Paul's view. First of all, in verses 4 and 5, his character, the character of Philemon. Then secondly, he talks, Paul talks about in verse 6, his faith. And now in verse 7, Paul's view concerning Philemon's view of the saints and he says great joy consolation in thy love refreshed you've refreshed the saints so he makes another transition not only commending uh, Philemon and by the way isn't that disarming I mean if, if a man was a stalwart man and stout in his character and things I mean, he's almost just withered. I mean, look at all he's saying that how wonderful a person he is. Ready? Here comes the appeal. In other words, Paul's going to appeal to him. May I appeal to you this afternoon? The appeal. Look at verse 8. Wherefore, though, see the transition? Wherefore, though, I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. In other words, uh, I, I pray that this is a convenient time, that it's acceptable time, but I'm transitioning now. Look at verse 9. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged. Here he is. He's pulling his age on him. By the way, he's an apostle. Many of us believe that if the apostle visited the church, the pastor of the church just simply sat down and the good apostle would come and preach. I don't know, maybe we differ on that, but I was thinking uh, deference. Where's, where's Rachel? Is she in here? Deference. Deference. Character trait. School. Deference. Anyway, anyway go on. <laughs> Sorry about that, Rachel. All right. <clears throat> Look at verse 10. Here it comes, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. All right, here it comes. Here is the purpose of writing this. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. He is not his paternal son. He is not his son by physical birth. But he is telling Philemon that his that Onesimus is his son by spiritual birth. My son. And then he says, whom that I have what? Begotten in my bonds. Now Paul is in Rome and he's under house arrest, we believe probably for a couple of years maybe. And that's why you read in Ephesians about put on the whole armor of God. He sees this soldier who is standing in his house and he gives the, the implements of the armor and tells us and and applies those spiritually. So he's under house arrest and he says, in my bonds, although I'm locked up, although I'm a prisoner, he said, I've begotten this man. I, I have led him to Christ. Listen, beloved, no matter what condition you might be in, you can lead somebody to Christ. So he says that my son, and mentions the name now, he's, he's going on behalf of Onesimus, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and me. Profitable to thee and me. 
It's believed that Onesimus was a slave under Philemon's uh, tenure and, and uh, office, and so that Onesimus took off and ran off. He was a runaway. He wound up in Rome. Paul met him in Rome, and it's uh, according, according to Paul, he led him to Christ. He's now saved. He's now, notice, a brother, a son to Paul, but he's a brother to Philemon. Right. Do you follow the language? Son and brother. And he says here, at one time he was unprofitable to thee in the past. Philemon's name means affectionate. Isn't that interesting? How that Paul appeals to his name, thy love, thy faith. Do you follow? And then secondly, Onesimus is a name that means profitable profitable. At one time he was unprofitable to thee. Verse 12, whom that I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. In other words, I beg of you by everything that is within me, not outside, but within me, to receive him. To receive him. And then in verse 14, but without thy mind, would I, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 13, whom that I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have uh, ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. In other words, I wanted to hold him here with me in Rome, but I'm sending him back to you. Sure. And in verse 14, but without thy, thy mind, in other words, without your okay, without your say, I'm sending him back. Uh, would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as, as it were of necessity, but what? Willfully. Willingly. Uh, <clears throat> Peter talks about those who are ignorant willingly. You're willingly ignorant. You can be ignorant and just not know something. But when you know something and <laughs> you don't do it, that's willful ignorance. He said, listen, I'm appealing to your will. By the way, this quality, and I haven't mentioned it yet, that I'm asking you to take on as a corporate body and as individuals, it's something that you do volitionally. It's a willful act. It isn't something that just comes automatic. It's a willful act. And so he's asking his friend Philemon to make a willful act choice and decision. Verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, and he did, that thou shouldest what? Receive him forever. Right. Wow. Paul is still pouring it on. Listen, he's come back to you. I've sent him back. Look at verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in flesh and in the Lord? Paul says to Philemon, listen, this man Onesimus, I'm sending him back to you. I would like to keep him here and minister with me. By the way, the word minister is serving. That's what a minister does. He serves. And he says, I would rather that he serve me. But I'm sending him back, Philemon. That not only is he going to be profitable to you for the time being, but what? Forever. He goes on to say in verse 17, and here comes the, the part I want you to see. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as what? Myself. In other words, as you would receive me being a partner, and I believe the partnership is spiritually in the Lord, as you would receive me, receive this man, Onesimus. Verse 18, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee, put that on my account. Those are the words I want you to see. Put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. There are some parts of the epistles that he writes. He does not write. He dictates them. But he says, I write this. This is a personal letter to you. 
And then he continues to say, uh, <clears throat> written in my own hand, I will repay it, albeit that I do not say to thee how that thou owest me thy, uh, even thine own self beside. Paul now is the clincher. He says, receive him as you would receive Paul. And he said, anything that he owes you, put it to my account. I want to explain that for a few minutes. And we're getting ready to close. So settle down. Don't worry. Time is escaping here. And he's saying, uh, he brings up, that there's something that Philemon owes Paul. Right. I believe it's his salvation. Sure. And I'll show you something with coordinating that in just a moment. Notice in verse 20 and 21. Yea, brother, let me have joy, uh, uh, joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. In other words... You do what I say. May I be refreshed by that. Verse 21, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee knowing that thou wilt also do more than I ask. Now, the truth that I'm trying to show you, and I'll come back and use a couple of verses to show you what I'm talking about, is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You show me a church that as a corporate body practice forgiveness, I'll show you a strong church. You show me an individual who practice forgiveness on an individual basis, I'll show you a person who's strong spiritually. Forgiveness is contrary to our nature. Well, what's my nature? Well, I don't know about your nature, but I can tell you about mine. <laughs> I know my own nature. Go to... Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 with me. My own nature is you do something to me, I do something back to you. You do something bad to me, I do it worse back to you. Now I know none of you have that bad nature that I have. I know I'm the only one that has that kind of nature. But if you do me dirty, I'm going to do you much worse. Why? Because of my nature. However, if as a believer, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says to me, son, don't you realize what I've done for you? Lord, I don't want to talk about it right now. You know, have you ever had that conversation? I've had that conversation many times. Lord, don't talk to me right now. I, I'm, I'm feasting him. I'm... I'm stewing in my brew. I don't mean booze. I'm just sulking. Yeah. By the way, we have that. Uh, you have that with uh, Elijah, Jonah. Right. Hello? Yeah. And uh, can you imagine a man told to go to a city, just say eight words to it, yet 40 days, and thou shalt be what? Overthrown? And he sees thousands of respond to it, even to the kingship, and he gets mad and angry at God because God saved them. God uh, had an influence on them. And what does he do? He goes out on the hillside, sits over there, and <coughs> pouts. Now, I know you've never done that. that. God did something, and it wasn't to your liking. And well, I know you never did that. That was only me and people like me. So anyway... Uh, <clears throat> Paul's saying, I'm aged, you owe me a lot. Do this for me. Go to Ephesians 4. Verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby that ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Then we have several internal sins. Uh, I was preaching, I don't know, a few years ago 
at this age, you forget what you did uh, yesterday. But anyway, a few years ago, and I said, listen to the congregation. I have two Holy Spirits. Most people only have one. I have two. One's an internal Holy Spirit, and the other's an external Holy Spirit. That was the life. You're supposed to laugh. I'm old. Give me the, you know, humor me a little bit. But quench not the Holy Spirit. What quenches the Holy Spirit? Well, he tells us here. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But did you see what ends that verse 31? It's a colon. Colon, two dots. In English, what happens when you have a colon is that there's a statement made, a colon follows, and then there's an explanation why the colon and why the statement was made. I'm not an English, well, I do teach English a little bit, but uh, it wouldn't hurt to understand our English Bible, would it? Uh, Look, what he says in verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Oh, I see now the argument that I've had is, Lord, right now I don't want you to talk to me about being forgiving because I want to stew in my brew. I want to be my own person. I want to do this. And he continues to talk to me. Now, what does it take for us to forgive? I think there's some clues are here. Be kind is one thing. Another is tender hearted. I think that's a big thing. Beloved, how tender hearted are you? How tender hearted are we? Tender hearted means that you can be touched, you have a sensitivity by words that are spoken to you. Tender hearted. You saw Pastor Wagon shoots. He showed some of his tender heart a while ago. Did he not? Hello. Anybody still awake? Okay. It's almost over. Touched by words. Touched by words. When I heard that my nephew's wife said, let's pray that God gets the glory from this incident. We know it's his will. Let's pray that God gets the glory and we see people saved from it. I don't know about you, but that touched my heart. Tender hearted. How easily is your heart touched? Did you hear all that Paul said to Philemon? He used words. Words. The only way God can communicate to you and me is by his words. By his words are we tender hearted. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. When we have anger, bitterness, wrath, clamor, evil speaking, that grieves the Holy Spirit. That saddens him. That doesn't allow him to work freely in a congregation. Years ago, I started preaching more about the inner sins than I did about the outer sins. You know, you can dress up the outside. <laughs> but we don't do a good job about the inside, do we? I want you to go back to Philemon. Notice Paul said these words. He said in verse 18, If he, talking about Onesimus, hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, in other words, owe you something, put that on my account. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, John says that Jesus Christ is our advocate. If you can get this picture, Jesus Christ standing, when our name is brought up, Frank Williams did this, Jesus Christ standing there and says, Father, I paid the whole price for him. Father, put that to my account. 
In theology, we call that imputation. In reality, if any of you have a checking account, reconciliation is similar. In other words, you get a statement from the bank, and the bank says you have X number of dollars. You look in your checkbook, and you see that you only have X number of dollars, and what you have is more than what they say, and you begin to reconcile your statement, right? I'm sure everybody does that. I find that most people do not. But anyway, you reconcile your accounts and you see that they have something recorded that you did not or that you made a mistake in your math. Of course we don't. But anyway, and there's reconciliation. Do you understand that our advocate, the Lord Jesus, (laughs) says to the Father, Father, you required this. That's propitiation. But, Father, it's reconciled because I fulfilled everything that you required. Mm -hmm. Put it to my account. I don't know about you, but, boy, oh, boy, does that give me a lot of security. And Paul used the word confidence. (laughs) Confidence. He said, I have confidence, Philemon, that what I ask of you, you will do. Beloved church, learn to practice forgiveness. Forgiveness is volitional. I've not tried to go long, but I think I've gone longer than I need to. But if you would just hang with me for a few minutes, I have a story to tell you. Years ago, a dear brother in Christ said some harsh things about me. Now, of course, we always think that we don't deserve harsh things being said. But anyway, they were said, and they were said among a group of other men. And uh, I found out about it, and I became angry. In the process of time, that same man who said those things sent me a gift with a letter inside the gift telling me how wicked I am and how bad I am and everything. Now, who wants to hear that? Nobody wants to hear that, but sometimes we need to hear that, don't we? Hello. And uh, I didn't like what was said in the letter. I took the letter and I filed it away. File 13. That's the trash can. But I kept the gift In my morning devotions, the Lord was talking to me and says, you still have anger in your heart and bitterness there. You need to get rid of it. Lord, I I deserve to be angry. You know know what this person said. So anyway, the Lord and I, we had a long chat on many occasions. And it usually was at devotional time in the morning. Now, I know that doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me. And so he and I chatted a whole lot, and he says, you need to pick that gift up. And I said, no, Lord. I... Then finally I acquiesced and said, uh, yes, sir, I, 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 I'll pick the gift up. So I picked the gift up and began to use it. It happened to be a book, and I was reading it. And the Lord talking to me some more and said, uh, you're still not forgiving. You're still bitter. You're still angry. You need to take care of that. And I wrestle with the Lord again. I don't know how much you struggle with the Lord, but there are times, you know, being a hard-headed Kentuckian, it takes a lot. Anyway. And then finally, the Lord says, until you take that gift and you use it, not just read it, but you use it, you're not going to be able to forgive. And finally, I said, yes, Lord, I will do that. And so I commenced preaching out of that book. And the dear God in heaven 
provided me the ability to forgive because forgiveness on a human level is volitional. You must do it. Beloved, I don't know what the Lord has to say to you or prove to you about that quality of forgiveness. But if you could go back to Philemon and listen to Paul say, and listen, whatever he owes you, you put it to my account. And Paul says, I will repay it. And see the picture of Jesus talking to the Father, saying that whatever he has done, Father, I have paid the price. I have imputed righteousness to him. Forgiveness. Let's stand together, shall we? My Father.